We are returning where we left off. Uh, 2 Peter chapter 3, if you'll turn there with me. The past couple of weeks, as we've gathered, we've examined the cross of Christ and the resurrection of Christ. We looked at the foundations of our faith. Um, Today we're going to continue to teach through the scriptures so that we can be challenged and corrected and grow in our faith. So as is our practice here and our our preference here, uh, we'll just continue on going through the word. If you'll uh, turn with me there. Just a reminder, and a lot of this is repetition. I know Nicole gave a lot of these announcements, but Peter is all about repetition. This is our last week of the winter session of our growth groups. So not this Wednesday night, but next Wednesday night, we're going to gather here at 630, all together as a church family, if you're able, and we'll be picking up in Jeremiah chapter 6, if you want to read ahead. Um, you probably got time to read 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6 to catch you up. And we'll only have two weeks of that, and then we're going to start our growth group session again for the spring, so that... That will go May and June, and then we'll have July and August off from growth groups, and that'll give us time to do a big chunk of Jeremiah. School of Ministry, those that have been interested in that, will actually begin the last Sunday of this month, uh, April 28th at 6 p.m. The first class is um, unlike a lot of school ministries. The first class will be open to everyone that attends here. Um, regularly that uh, calls this their church home and wants to be a part of that. It's a required class for those that want to go through the whole two-year program and receive a certificate. Um, But if you want to come and and just engage that first class as the Calvary Chapel Distinctives and Philosophy of Ministry, I think it's extremely profitable. If you're looking for just something, the foundations of our faith or what is this crazy church all about, it gives you all of the biblical foundations for the things that we teach and believe. So um, if you're interested in doing that, please come prepared to that first class, having read the first three chapters, the introduction and first three chapters of the distinctives, because we're going to start right in. No, it's not going to be online, um, because much of these classes are going to be discussion, okay? So we can engage with one another. So let's pray, and we will begin our study. Father in heaven, we thank you, Lord, so much for the opportunity to gather and uh, that you've given us this place to meet in and given us the the freedom to do so, Lord, in this nation as we still have. And uh, pray that that remains, Lord, and ask that you will speak through the power of your word this morning, Lord, that you would pierce hearts, that you would correct, that you would encourage and strengthen and Lord for those that weren't able to join us and are and are watching online that that you would speak through your word to them and Lord as our ladies spend this final week preparing for this time that they're setting apart to be with you would you just pour out your spirit on them both teacher and recipient Lord that you would move in a mighty way in each of their lives that they would meet with you and they would come back uh, being different, Lord, having spent time with you. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. So one more announcement. Guys, we are gonna have our time. Uh, The dates for that, if you wanna put it in your calendar, is September 20th, that weekend. That's a Friday, so it'll be Friday, Saturday, and maybe early Sunday morning, we'll see. And that if you were with us last time out at Crossroads Christian Camp, that's where it will be. So, 2 Peter chapter 3, if you'll turn there with me. I don't hear pages turning, but I've asked you to turn three times, so I guess you're there. He begins, or continues, in this short little letter. Beloved, I now write to you the second epistle, in both of which I stir up your pure minds by way of reminder, that you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandments of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior. If you remember back in chapter 1, Peter told us that he would not neglect to remind us of these things. Peter knew that repetition was our friend. 
I think sometimes we get tempted, especially in church, when we hear something or somebody begins teaching something and we immediately think, oh, I know this, or oh, I've heard this. And we can kind of shut off or shut down or assume what we knew before is what the word is speaking today. And we forget that this is living and powerful. It doesn't change, but we do over time. And the correction that comes with it and the encouragement that comes from it can be applicable in a different way today than it was 10 years ago. So Peter's saying that I'm going to repeat some things. I'm going to remind you of some things. And there are some staples in life that we need to continue to feed from if we hope to have health and strength. We can't always be seeking the new or the the gourmet or living off appetizers, right? But there's value in our daily bread and the, the foundations and the fundamentals and being familiar with these things. And as I mentioned in this class, the Calvary Distinctives, I know some of you guys have read that several times, but I still would encourage you to attend and, and be grounded and, and learn it in such a way that you can share it with someone else. In our second chapter, he really gives strong warning to false teachers and false prophets. If you remember, his first letter that he wrote was much about persecution that was happening from the outside world onto the church and scattering Christians abroad. And then in this letter, he says, you know what, guys? It's not just from the outside, but it's from within. There will be false teachers and there will be false doctrine that begins to spread within the church. And, and it's interesting to me as we read these things, he doesn't say, so look out for this, this, and that, right? He, he tells us to be grounded and to repeat these things and to be reminded of the things that you know. How, how many of you guys have ever worked in a bank or, or like a teller of some sort? Okay, a few of you. You know that the training for that is not like to look at charts of all different kinds of counterfeit bills. It's to work with hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of real bills. So you know the, the real. You're familiar with the real. So when the um, counterfeit shows up, something's not right. right. And that's Peter's encouragement to us that we would know the word of God. That we would know Jesus in a personal way so that when a false teacher comes in or when there's a false um, doctrine being spread, there's a there's a check in your spirit. And, and maybe you can't identify exactly what it is, but you know that it's not truth and you know that it needs to be checked out. So he warns us of this in the second chapter and, and notice in the second verse here that Peter puts the words of the apostles on the same level of the holy prophets. And that was a big deal. It was a big deal to do that, but it was a big deal to those that were reading this. But notice it's not just any apostles or missionaries. We explained as we went through um, passages leading up to this that sometimes the Bible refers to men as apostles that are missionaries or someone like we might consider a church planner, taking the word where it hasn't been. They're a messenger being sent, a representative of God. But these were distinguished as the apostles of our Lord and Savior, the men that were with Jesus. So that apostolic revelation that Peter's talking about here that is actually scripture does not continue on today. Um, it's different. So he, he distinguishes that and he says these words that were spoken by the holy prophets and of the commandment of us. So Peter was aware, at least at this point, that what he was writing was actually holy scripture and what the other men were writing was scripture. Verse 3. He says, knowing this first, that scoffers will come in the last days, walking according to their own lusts, and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. How many of you think that this is a fitting description of the times that we're in? Yeah. It, it, my caution is we read this today, and it's easy for us to do exactly as the scoffers are doing. I right, see Peter gives us some insight here into their logic and their flawed reasoning. And I say we can do the same thing by limiting our perspective um, or our knowledge just to our limited perspective. Right? What we can see 
or what we have personally experienced, we are, are faced with scoffers nearly every single day, and we can assume that it's always been this way, that things have never changed. And that's really the argument that Peter's saying. That's, that's what they're saying. But I want you to consider even the prophetic application of these words that Peter's giving us. He, he wrote this over 2,000 years ago. And he says that scoffers will come. And today we have scoffers. But understand that when this was written, evolution wasn't being taught. Right? Evolution was something that Darwin uh, and his flawed theory just came up with in the, the late 1830s. And he, he never published his book, um, The Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection, until sometime in 1859. And many say that every generation that has come since, since the days of the apostle, they thought that they were living in the end times. Yet the rapture of the church has not yet happened. It's been such a long time, they say, that if he was going to come, he would have come already. So that's the thinking is that things are just continuing on as they've always been. And, and it doesn't change. He continues on explaining the thinkers of the scoffers and these false teachers in verse 5. It says, for this they will willfully forget. It's quite a statement. They will willfully forget that by the word of God, the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of water and in the water, by which the world that then existed perished, being flooded with water, but the heavens and the earth, which are now preserved by the same word, are reserved for fire until the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. So in their limited perspective of the way that the things are now, right, as, as, as they receive these words, are the way that things have always been. Life happens, uh, Things live, things die, maybe things evolve in, in, in their thinking, and then die and repeat, right? It just, it just continues on. But that, that theory fails to consider the truth. It willfully forgets the truth. They do what they do and they live and they walk according to their own lusts, Peter says, because from their perspective, there's no consequences, there's no judgment. Jesus isn't going to hold them to account. They see no judgment in their time and in their place. But sadly, just because someone believes something to be true, doesn't make it true. And just because they don't want to believe the Bible, doesn't mean that it's not true. And it doesn't make it false. See, a biblical worldview of creation and the fall of man the destruction of every living thing on the planet besides those that God himself closed into the ark impacts if we walk according to our lusts or according to the will of God. In, in verse 5 it says again that they willfully forget. They choose not to know the truth. They choose to ignore the truth. And they choose to forget what both creation and the Holy Spirit witnesses to them throughout their lives. And they say that there is no judgment. And things are as they've always been. And it's a completely false premise. There was, there was never rain before the flood. Right? As, as Noah built that ark and years and years and years went by, nearly a hundred years. And he's, he's speaking of these things to come and this destruction that would fall. Yet rain had never come. So when he spoke of a flood and he spoke of rains coming, people thought he was wacko. The, the world at that time was covered by a canopy that allowed for the perfect climate to take place. Apparently, Maine was nowhere in the center of that. <laughs> um, because none of it stuck. Except maybe a few months in the fall. But our oceans changed. And our landscapes changed dramatically. Things like the Grand Canyon. Our climate changed drastically 
And we continue to find proof of that. We continue to find fossilized animals with undigested food in their bellies that gives us an indication of, of what the climate was like, where they lived, what, what it was like in our North Pole, what it was like in our South Pole. But they willfully forget, it says, that the world that then existed no longer exists like it once did. Verse 6 says that it perished, flooded by water. But the heavens and the earth that were once created by the spoken word of God are now preserved by that same word. But there's another major day of judgment coming, Peter tells us. In fact, the Bible tells us that there will be a brand new heaven and a brand new earth after the tribulation period. What we know now will be completely destroyed. This podium up here, gone. Everything that you see in this room, gone. My flesh, destroyed. He who holds it all together, right? the unknown nuclear glue that scientists talk about, the hand of God will let go. And it will all be destroyed. Not by water, right? He promised to never destroy the entire earth by water again, but by fire as part of the judgment of ungodly men. Our flesh may be destroyed. The flesh of ungodly men will be destroyed, but not our souls, right? That part of us is eternal. What we do with Jesus determines our eternity. What forever and ever and ever will be like. These last day scoffers will willfully forget or choose, actually, by willfully forgetting, they're choosing to believe a lie. But the Bible tells us, and this is the testimony, that God has given us eternal life. And this life is in his son. This is 1 John chapter 5. He who has the son has life. He who does not have the son of God does not have life. Life without Jesus is not life. It is eternal separation from God in hell. Life does not cease to exist. Those in hell are not void of consciousness. Peter tells us just because we haven't seen it yet, it doesn't mean that this is not happening. In fact, in the waiting is salvation. Look at it with me in verse 8. He says, but beloved, do not forget this one thing, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. He's actually quoting from a passage or referencing a passage from Psalm 90, verse 4, which says, for a thousand years in your sight are like yesterday when it is past and like a watch in the night. See, again, this, this, this view that we have from our limited perspective of experience, we exist inside of time, right? God exists outside of time. I don't know that we can fully comprehend that. Again, if we have this limited worldview based only upon what we can see, what we can touch, what we can experience, then 2,000 years seems like a really, really, really long time. But God who is eternal, who, who exists within eternity, views time from that perspective, views, views a thousand years as if it were a day. So when you consider that, and he speaks of I'm coming back soon, and it's just been a little over 2,000 years, but yet we don't want to take false assurance that it's going to be long from now. We don't want to assume that it's not going to be today because everything that needs to occur before him coming back for his church has happened. So we're no longer walking down a timeline building up to this event. We're, we're walking parallel and just waiting for it to happen. Continuing on in verse 9, it says, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise and the elements will melt with fervent heat, both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. 
And now I got to tell you, I was tempted to spend the rest of our entire time talking about this description of the day of the Lord coming as a thief in the night. And, and I think some of you probably would have loved to engage in that discussion. But when you consider the emphasis of Peter here and, and really asking the Lord what's applicable for us here, it's the application that comes after this. Right? There's an assumption when Peter says this that here's what's going to happen and it's going to happen. This is truth. So here's what you, Christian, need to do as a result of it. Uh, and Peter then stops talking about these scoffers. And he stops talking about those that don't believe. And he shifts to talking to us. He shifts and he begins talking to the believers. And he gives us practical application in light of this truth that he gives us. And he, in fact, he switches completely and he starts laying out these imperative commands for us. Here's what we are to do. This is happening. And here's how you must respond. And he begins that in verse 11. He says, therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, since this is happening, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? He asks the question and then, he, and then he answers it for us. But we are to be this type of persons in holy conduct and godliness. Okay, Peter, what does this look like? And this is a good opportunity for him to remind us of those things, or me to remind us of, of what he gave us in chapter 1. He gave us specific things in chapter 1, and he told us to be diligent about those things. To be diligent about them. To be purposeful, to be intent, to, to, to set our mind to it, to be disciplined in those things. But yet, we've taken two weeks off from the book of Peter. And I wonder how many of those things come to mind as we talk about them. It's a challenge to me and probably a challenge to a lot of you. So, so we'll review them. We'll repeat them. We'll remind ourselves of what they are from 2 Peter chapter 1. and verse 5, he says, But also for this very reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue. And to virtue, knowledge to knowledge, self-control. To self-control, perseverance. And to perseverance, godliness. This is the same godliness that he references in chapter 3. So these are the things that we're supposed to be diligent about. And, and part of that diligence is if we don't fully understand what that means or, or the application of it, then, then we, we study that. Right? If we're to be diligent about these things and, and the destruction of all things is coming and there's scoffers in our time, then we need to be diligent about these things. We need to apply ourselves to these things because these are the types of persons we should be, he says. And then he continues on with these, these imperative commands in verse 12, back in chapter 3. He says, looking for and hastening the coming of of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. So we should be waiting, but not just sitting on our hands, right? We should be waiting and looking with anticip anticipation and not just looking, but I want you to look at verse 12 again that we are to hasten the day of God. What does that mean? To hasten something. Make it quick, hurry it along, make it come. Isn't that kind of crazy? When you, when you actually think about the application of that, we're to be looking for, I get that, right? We're waiting for the return of the Lord and hastening the coming of the day. So that doesn't just imply that says that we can have an impact on when that day comes. It, it, it sort of sounds heretical when you hear it. But this is what it says, that we can hasten that. We can have an impact on that. We can speed that along. Hmm. How can we hasten it? 
Let's look at one verse in Romans. Romans chapter 11, verse 25. It says, Therefore, beloved, looking forward to these things... We're in the wrong spot, guys. Let's see. No. For I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own opinion that the blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. That's interesting theology by Paul. I love what Peter says later about Paul in our chapter here. We'll get to that in just a minute. But this thing he mentions until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And he talks about this blindness of Israel. And this blindness of Israel is continuing on to this day. Right? I mean, you see millions of Israelites returning to the land, which is awesome. Right? Speaks of things to come. But they haven't yet all recognized Jesus as their Messiah. Many of the Jews are still waiting for Messiah to come, not realizing that it's Jesus. But this hastening speaks to the latter part of this until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. Right? The Lord opened salvation up to us. A Gentile is a non-Jew. And apparently there's a, a fixed number or a certain group or, or something to indicate that when the fullness of the Gentiles has come in, he's coming back. It's time. So how can we hasten that? There's some empty seats here this morning. The people that you invited last week, get them back or get new ones or tell them about your faith. Tell them the gospel, the good news of salvation. Read these things and understand these things to be truth and that should put a desperation in your heart for those that you love that aren't saved. Right, that it could be today. And in, in this blindness, so the day of the Gentiles comes in, and then we get into this period called the tribulation where God deals with Israel, right? And they come to realization of who the Messiah is, but he also pours out his wrath on a Christ-rejecting world. And we're going to get into all of that. This day of the Lord that I just kind of passed over, we're going to dig in deep to that in just, just a few weeks as we're in the book of Revelation. Weeks, months, whatever it takes to get there. We got 1 John, 2 John, 3 John. But you and I can affect this, gang. We can pray and we can say, Lord, why do you tarry? Because the fullness of the Gentiles hasn't come in. And we can be a part of that. We can affect that. Verse 14, back in chapter 3. Therefore, beloved, looking forward to these things, be diligent to be found by him in peace without spot and blameless and consider that the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation. As also our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given to him, has written to you. There it is. The long-suffering of our Lord is salvation. Right? We might complain or dread every day that the Lord tarries. God, I don't understand. Why don't you just come back? Why don't you rescue us from the sinful world? But it isn't because he's lazy or because he lacks motivation. It's because of love. Every day he waits is salvation for another. And when you consider that, there are several of you in this room that are very thankful the Lord didn't come back 20 years ago. Or others maybe five years ago. I know some others five months ago. Eternity would have been different had the Lord not tarried. But there are others there's others in this room that need to know that he could come back today. And are you ready? In verse 16, he continues this, so referencing the end of this about Paul, as also our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given to him, has written to you, and then I love this, as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, which are some things hard 
to understand. Isn't that kind of cool? That Peter says, hey, I get you guys. I have a hard time understanding some of the stuff Paul writes too. He's, he's so smart. He knows so much of the scriptures. And there's so much depth to what he, to what he writes. Man, sometimes I got I to gotta chew through it. I got to meditate on it. I have to consider it before the Lord. I have to ask the Lord to reveal the truth of it to me because some of it's tough stuff. But then he gives this caution because of it. Some things are hard to understand which untaught and unstable people twist to their own destruction as they do also the rest of the scriptures. So that's a caution to people who read things into the scriptures that they want to read in, but it's also a caution to us to be like that bank teller, right? And to know the truth and to study the truth. And when something doesn't make sense or we don't understand, dig into it. Ask an older brother or sister in the Lord. Get a good commentary or Bible dictionary and go through and break it down. And study the things of the word to, to show ourselves to be good stewards, good students, that we would know the word of God. He says in verse 17, you therefore, beloved, since you know this beforehand, I'm writing this, I'm giving you a warning, since you know this beforehand, beware lest you also fall from your own steadfastness being led away with the error of the wicked. But grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and forever. Amen. Notice what he says. We are to grow in the perfect grace of God and knowledge of God. Or does it say that his grace would grow in us, that his grace would grow, his grace is perfect, his grace is complete, but they would, that we would grow in the grace and the knowledge of God. That means both intellectual knowledge, right, that we would study these things, that we would learn these things, that we would learn about the attributes of God so that when we're in a trial, when we're in a crisis of life, we know in whom we place our faith is bigger than any issue that we could ever have. But it also speaks of increasing our personal knowledge, our relational knowledge with Jesus. Stagnation doesn't do it. Right? That's not abiding in Christ. We need to be growing. We need to continually be moving. Titus actually gives us some good information on, on what growing in the grace of God does in our lives. And I, I just want to look at this quick and I'll close with this actually. Uh, Titus chapter 2, beginning in verse 11, he writes, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. All men have been exposed to the grace of God, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present age. This present age is right now when we're living. Looking for, with anticipation, the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and puri purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. Is that a description of us? That he's purified us? That we're his own special people, set apart, sanctified for his use, and that we're zealous for good works? We're looking for ways to serve him? That's sort of the challenge, the taking it home question on your, on your growth group this week um, concerning that. I said I'd close with that. So I will transition into, back to our chapter though. I just want you to look at these commands he gives us. And you can underline them in your Bible if you do that. If not, maybe you want to write them down just as you know, I find these things helpful. I told you guys from the um, Forgiving Forward book, there's a little bookmark, and it just hits the bullet points and reminders, and I keep that in my Bible. 
Because I find those reminders and those things helpful. And, and in 2 Peter chapter 3, I have these imperative commands underlined so that that's what my eye sees. This truth is coming. This is happening. And in light of that, this is how I'm to be living. So just looking at that, verse 11, we're to be in holy conduct. Right? The way that we live should be a testimony to the world around us. It should be louder than any sermon that we would ever preach. We're to be in holy conduct and godliness. Verse 12, we are to be looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God. Playing our role in that hastening. Some plant, some water, and some harvest. Talk about Jesus. Have his word on your lips. The word of God goes out and accomplishes its purpose and does not return void. I was having a conversation with a gentleman yesterday. The city was talking to a woman about the gospel, and she said, well, I just don't believe those things. And he said, well, maybe I'm too vocal. Maybe I shouldn't talk about those things. And it's like, no, today is the day, right? We need to be bold. We need to let the word of God come out of our mouths. Verse 13, look for new heavens and a new earth. Verse 14, looking forward to these things, listen, be diligent. Be diligent to be found by him in peace without spot and blameless. Verse 15, consider the long suffering of our Lord is salvation. Right? His delay, his patience is salvation for those that have not yet been saved as we are hastening his return by sharing the gospel. Skip down to verse 17. Beware lest you also fall from your own steadfastness being led away, but grow. Grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That's his ending command for us, that we would grow, that we would be active, that we would be diligent about these things. Grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and forever. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this short little letter and all the instruction that comes with it. And Lord, as we, as we consider these things, as we chew on these things in the coming day of the Lord and that all that we see, all that we know will, will be destroyed, that it will create uh, a passion for souls, Lord, a burden for the lost. Lord, that we wouldn't say we believe these things but not live like we believe these things. Lord, we know that in Christ is life. Give us the boldness, give us the, the courage, the filling of your Holy Spirit to pour out the truth to those around us, Lord. Lord, that, that they would hear your word, that they would hear your voice. We ask, Lord, that... Um, the people that you put us in contact with this week, you would start even now drawing them by your Holy Spirit. Lord, causing them to recognize their need for a Savior. We love you, Lord. We're so thankful that you delayed so that we could be saved. And we do pray, Lord, come quickly. In Jesus' name, amen.